Pentecost, fire fall on me. On the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me. Help me say, fire, 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 fire,
Verses 1 through 4. And the New International Version says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Amen. You may be seated in God's house. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his word. As we continue our series entitled There Is No Box, I'd like to tag this particular text and message for these brief moments of sharing that we have together this morning with the title, When God Comes to Your House. When God Comes to Your House. There is a legend, according to the Reverend Dr. William Watley, that says that after Jesus ascended into heaven, when he got back to heaven as the exalted and reigning and resurrected Christ, that some of the angels were curious about his earthly mission and had a few questions for him upon his return. They asked Jesus, did you found a great movement? Did you lead a great army? How many followers did you have? To which Jesus replied, I generally attracted good crowds, but really I only had 12 disciples and a handful of friends and dedicated followers. Well, well, the angel said, if there were so few, they must have been exceptional people with sterling characters, people who were leaders in their communities and successful in their careers. And Jesus looked at the angels and said, well, actually, these were rather ordinary people. I had a tax collector who liked to lie a lot. I had a lot of fishermen, and I had just common working folk who were serving and working alongside me. Well, the angels looked at him and said, well, evidently, Jesus, they must have been a very loyal group. And Jesus said, well, let me stop you there. I believe they wanted to be loyal, but in my hour of crisis, one betrayed me, another denied me, and almost all of them just kicked me to the curb. And, and yet, Yet, they said, yet, Jesus, you left those people there to carry on your work? He said, yes, I did, excitedly to the angels. Surely, the angel said, you got to have another plan. You got to have an alternative plan. Jesus said, no, I have no alternate plan. Angel said, but you got to have another group in reserve somewhere in the event that that one, because that one, that group of folks is surely going to fail. And, and what well, Jesus looked at them and said, I don't have another group. This group is the only one that I'm depending on because this group is my church. So as unstable and as unreliable as all of us are, as easily as we become discouraged and distracted, as quickly as we get tired and ready to give up on church, as often as we're inclined to complain and engage in self-pity, as stubborn as we are and as insistent in walking in our own will, as weak and unworthy as we are, the fact remains that Jesus has committed to all of us this work of his kingdom. And if we're truly going to represent Jesus in ways that make Jesus irresistible to the world, then we must be willing to let the spirit of the Holy Ghost into our house. Now, metaphorically, I'm not simply talking about the physical dwelling you occupy that provides shelter for you and your family, but I'm talking about this house, the house of this earthly tabernacle, this clay-bound castle, this house which holds your heart, your soul, and your mind. You got to let God into your house. Uh, there was this little, little old lady, little old lady, she lived on what, what everybody thought was the wrong side of the tracks for one year, for one whole year, she had been trying to join this fashionable downtown church. The pastor was not eager to have this sister disrupt uh, who looked, she was wearing faded, out of style clothes. He was, not, he was not well pleased to have her sitting in the pew next to the rich and powerful members of his congregation. Well, when she called the pastor for the fifth time to discuss membership, he put her off a fifth time and he said to her this, he said, I'll tell you what, you, you just go home 
home tonight and have a talk with God about this. Later, you can tell me what the Lord tells you. He, he, he didn't really think the Lord would talk to her. Well, the little old woman went her way. Weeks transitioned to months, and months transitioned into a year, and the pastor didn't see her anymore, and his conscience began to eat at him. Well, one day he was in the grocery store, and, and he saw her scrubbing floors down behind the counter in the grocery store, behind the fish counter in the grocery store, and he felt compelled to inquire, did you ever, sister, have your little talk with God? She said, oh my, yes, I talked with the Lord as you told me to, brother pastor. Well, the pastor said, what answer did the Lord give you? And she said, well, brother pastor, as she pushed back a wisp of stringy hair with her hands in suds, she said, God told me, don't you get discouraged, bigger, but to keep trying and keep going. He said that he himself had been trying to get in your church for years uh, and for the last 20 years, and he ain't been able to get in either. Uh, you do know there's stuff that you do where you don't let God into your space. Uh, we go to places. We have conversations. Some of us had conversations today or yesterday that God was not permitted by us to manifest his presence. Oh, think of some of the phone calls you make. You, you, you think the Lord is in there? You, you think of some of the things you say, you say and do to people. You think the Lord is in there? Oh, yes, if God desired, he could do whatever he wanted, when he wanted. But because my God is a door knocker, as opposed to busting the door down, he knocks, but you got to respond by letting him in. Even in the church, we sometimes have functions that are more focused on lifting us up than they are on magnifying the matchless and marvelous name of Jesus. In, in, in the house, in your own house, the language you use, the way you treat your body, the way you treat your family, the conversations you have, the unfriendly comments you make about others, the time we spend bickering over nothingness and the lifestyle that we lead when nobody is watching sometimes keeps God standing at the door waiting for us to let him in. Oh, yes, some of us are kind enough to oblige God and allow him into our houses uh, every once in a while when it's convenient for us, when we need something from the Lord, when we have a desire for God to heal our body, some chain to be broken, when we need a blessing, when we're down and almost defeated, perplexed, and in peril, we are then kind enough to welcome God in. And when he enters, after he turns your mess into miracle, after he changes your predicament into praise, after your viciousness turns to victory, after he turns struggles into strength we will do things and say things that put God right back out again when God comes to your house he wants to take root he wants to become a permanent resident in your house he wants to abide with you and have you abide in him so that you might become humbly privileged to, enough to ask whatever you will and it shall be done you can't just ask what you will and it shall be done you gotta abide in God and let God abide in you and then you can ask whatever you will and the scripture says it shall be done God wants to make you a living sanctuary a living testimony to his faithfulness and favor he wants your family to be filled with promise and possibility. He wants you to let him into the nooks and the crannies of your psychology, the back alleys of your past, and the hallways of your future. Is God at your house. Any cursory reading of the New Testament reminds us that the Lord sure left his work in some very shaky hands. Peter would speak before he thought about it. Jude, Judas had a secret agenda. Thomas was always skeptical. Philip asked crazy questions, and James and John tried to elbow their way into the top spot in the kingdom. Yet these were the ones who were told to be witnesses and proclaim salvation to the lost. Jesus left a disappointed church. They were disappointed because their expectations didn't match the outcome with Jesus. They thought he would inaugurate an earthly kingdom and saw themselves seated with Jesus in high places on the earth. They were confused because they had seen Jesus rebuke storms, cast out demons, heal the sick, and raise the dead. So how could he let himself be crucified? Oh, but I don't beat them up for their confusion and disappointment because their confusion was the confusion all of us feel when we see goodness abused and vilified at the hands of evil. We feel it when the promises of God don't match my present problems or my present pain. We feel it when we can't understand how people fight so hardly against love. How is there a counter position, an opposing position to love? How is love ever wrong? They, 
This group were, were weakened. They were frail, fragmented, frightened, lifeless church because they had lost the one who had called them from where they were and brought them together. Though the power of this text, though, is that despite their frailty and confusion, they were still hopeful, believing that God had a promise for the carpenter Christ. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. They were holding on to that in their hearts, their souls, and until Jesus would return. They held on to what he told them. Some of you have heard this story before, but it's been said that, that Niccolo Paganini was in concert when one of the strings on his instrument uh, snapped. He, he was a great violinist. The crowd laughed at him. He kept on playing, however, and shortly thereafter, another string on his violin broke. The crowd laughed at him again. Later, the third string broke, and Paganini continued to bring forth glorious music from the one string he had left. Uh, the audience looked on in wonder. They realized they were indeed in the presence of a master who could bring forth majestic music from a violin with just one good string. Uh, the truth is that sometimes life will snap and buckle on you in such a way that you get down to just one string. Uh, but if the master is at your house, uh, if the master is in your heart, then you can keep living life abundantly. Sometimes all you got to go on is your experience, your own reserved word that you hold in your heart. Sometimes life and reality will contradict your own beliefs. Uh, sometimes you won't know what tomorrow looks like. Uh, sometimes the only string you have left uh, is your knowledge of what Jesus has already done for you, how he made a way, how he fought your battles. But if you can remember that the Lord is with you always, uh, then you're putting yourself in position to keep playing life's instrument, even if you're down to one string. Somebody shout one string, one string, one string. If all I got is one string. And I got Jesus in my heart. I got Jesus in my house. If I just got one string. Guess what? The master can take my one string and turn my midnight into morning, my darkness into day. My God is able. He's able. He's able. Tra travel with me. Travel with me to the place we're striving to be as a church. Antioch, we are trying to be this Acts 2 church. This group of people, family and friends, were all in one place that they have been kicking it a few days now. The saints were assembled, y'all. They were assembled together and parenthetically understand that even a weak, frail church of Jesus is stronger than one individual. Even in a weak church, never underestimate the power of the children of God when folks assemble in Jesus' name. Our church would be so much more powerful if all of us showed up simply to assemble in Jesus' name. Oh, why did you come this morning? Why did you, did you come to see your friends? Did, did, did you come because you like sitting where you sit? Oh, fellowship would happen. Miracles would happen. Lives would be changed if we would get over ourselves and what we want and what we expect and just come to gather together as an act of faith in Jesus' name. Oh, if when you got up to go to church, all you thought about wasn't who was teaching Sunday school, who, who going to preach this morning, who, what they going to sing about today. Instead of thinking about all of that, if you just got up and said, I'm going in Jesus' name. I, 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 Jesus told me I need to go to church and don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together with your brothers and sisters. So guess what? I'm just showing up today. And I just want you to try it one time. Try it. Everybody in here that's here today, I, I want you at least one time. And, and, and imagine if we all tried it one time together. Uh, to, together with, with, with one accord. And it said they were in one place. And, and suddenly, suddenly, because they showed up in Jesus' name. Oh, seeing your friends is fine. I love, I love you seeing your friends at church. Getting the scoop on the latest dirt is juicy. I know it is. But if we're going to have Acts 2 power, then we need to have Acts 2 courage to show up in Jesus' name. You ought to come to church searching for Jesus, seeking Jesus, serving Jesus, standing on Jesus, singing for Jesus, speaking for Jesus. I will go in Jesus' name. Jesus, 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 how I love you, Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. It's the sweetest name I know, Jesus. Sweeter than the honey on the honeycomb, Jesus. Blesses fools and babies, Jesus. Yeah, I need Jesus. However you got to think about Jesus, you ought to keep Jesus on your mind when you're driving down the street on your way to church on Sunday morning. You ought to have Jesus in your heart when you walk through these doors. You ought to have Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his words. It sounds like music. 
in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love. Jesus and it said that the group a group of tribal chieftains they were in council together and each had their own plan for meeting an attack that was coming their way well an old and wise chief gave each uh, each person in the tribe a single stick and told them to break that stick he each did so without difficulty gathering the same number of sticks again the old chief bound them together into a bundle of sticks he passed it to each of the other chiefs and told them now you break it up uh, not even the strongest chief was able Able to break the bundle of sticks. And the truth is that God gave us to each other because we need each other. There is still power in the gathering of the church. When we're together, not even the gates of hell can prevail against God's church, but you got to let God into your house. The moment you let your guard down, you give the devil access to God's church. If you come and come and if you show up in the house of faith and you're coming for any reason other than Jesus, then you give, you may be the one that lets the gates of hell in. So every day, you got to be working, working on, on Jesus, working for Jesus, serving in Jesus, living with Jesus, letting Jesus walk with you, talk with you, God, your feet hold your hand. And suddenly the text says God came to the upper room house and became a lifelong resident in their lives. When God comes to your house, you realize that there's some things that's going to have to move suddenly. When he comes, your attitude got to move suddenly. I'm in the text. When he comes, your prejudice and pride and arrogance got to move suddenly. Stubbornness, sudden, suddenly. Fear, suddenly. Tension, suddenly. Sorrow and selfishness, suddenly. The Bible says, and suddenly, a new sheriff came to town uh, to create an atmosphere that was conducive to fellowship and following Jesus. Uh, and the text moved me to wonder, what happens when God comes to my house? Well, what is it? What is it that the text is teaching me? There are three answers, and I promise you, I'll sit down. The first suggestion is that when God comes into your house, there is a sudden sign of his power. When God comes to your house, there's a sudden sign of his power. The text says, and suddenly, you can't program or time God's spirit. You can't work him up or bring him in. You can't turn God off and on at your whim. You may be able to do that with your spirit, but not God's Holy Spirit. Uh, when God comes to your house, you're moved by his force, refreshed by his breeze. Uh, there's a sudden sign of the power of God in your life. Uh, a sign in the text is something that suggests the presence and existence of God in your situation. These followers of Jesus were assembled with one accord, meaning they had a unified vision and purpose, which was to adhere to the word's instructions. They shared a peculiar place of residency at this great moment in their history for a group of people to get together as long as they did and maintain consistency in what they were supposed to do in that upper room. That was a sign. Our love for one another is a sign that God is in our house. Uh, to further reflect the presence of God, there was a visible change in their ability. For the text says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The sign was change. Uh, when God comes to your house, there's a sign, and that sign is a change in your life, in your love, and in your labor. Uh, there's a change in your worship and in your work. Uh, a change in the atmosphere on your pew. Uh, you should want your pew to be known as the place where the Spirit is always welcome. Uh, there's a change in your intention and in your motivation. There's a change in your disposition and your skill set. When God comes, you realize that you can do all things uh, through Christ who strengthens you. That is a sign. There's a sign of God's God's power, a sign of God's power. D.E. King tells a story of when, when, when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and, and, and D.E. goes to Atlanta to console Dr. King's father and his mama. And, and then later, two years later, A.D. Williams, Dr. King's brother, drowned he goes back to Atlanta, D.E. does, to console Daddy King. Then after that, Daddy King's wife was shot to death during a church service, sitting at the piano, and he flo flies down to Atlanta again. He didn't know what to say. These three deaths back to back to back for Daddy King. He went to Daddy King's house. He went to Daddy King's bedroom. He met, he met him halfway and said, Daddy King said, I'm glad to be here. He said, yeah, I thank God for what I have left. Oh, and D.E. King looked at Daddy King and didn't know what he was talking about. D.E. said, well, what do you have left, Daddy King? Everybody is gone. A.D. is gone. Martin is gone. Your wife is gone. He said, God, I still got God. 
See, when God comes to your house, you know that when you've got nothing left, you still got God. God changes my language. He changes my commitment. He changes my anxieties. Uh, the songwriter said he soothes my doubts uh, and he calms my fears uh, and he dries my tears. Uh, he changes my walk. Uh, he orders my steps. Uh, he guides my feet. Uh, he holds my hand. Uh, he opens the door. Uh, he builds new bridges. Uh, he strengthens my character. There's a sign of God's power. Uh, the hymnologist put it like this. Uh, what a wonderful change uh, in my life has been wrought uh, since Jesus came in to my heart. Uh, when God comes to your house, there's a sudden sign of his power. But not only is there a sudden sign of his power, but there is the sound of his presence. There's a sound of his presence. These faithful followers of Jesus, when the Spirit of God came to their hearts, came to their house, the text says suddenly there was a sound. There was a sound that came from heaven, but that was not the only sound that began to fill the house. There was another sound. That sound was of their voices raised, speaking in other languages so that the people who were outside of the house could experience the power of the glory of God being revealed inside the house. Oh, my goodness. What in the world would we do if we were so filled with God inside the church that folk outside the church could hear us talking? Now, we ain't even got to be talking loud because it doesn't and say they were shouting and yelling but what if we just had God God was so filling our spirits that when we showed up and we started talking to each other saying good morning to each other God bless you I'm encouraging you today that folks outside would hear uh, hear something strange coming from 89th and Cedar and line up down the block to see what it is that God is doing in this place Oh, it was a sound in there of collaborative voices harmonizing in symphonic chorus testifying together to the wonderful works of God in the words of the, of the Old Testament songs. Uh, it was the sound of Galileans uh, speaking in languages that they had never heard or learned. Uh, when God comes to your house, uh, there is a sound, uh, the sound of people getting along, uh, not concerned about your self-interest or your egotism. When God comes to your house, there's the sound of people encouraging each other and healing chatter that's intended for the greater good. Uh, when God is truly in your heart, uh, then our dialogue on race uh, will move us from alienation uh, and marginalization uh, to reconciliation. Uh, there's the sound of people and families uh, sharing the same passion uh, so that they're operating with the same power. Uh, there's the sound of voices uh, extended only uh, as method methodologies uh, by which God can use your mouth uh, for his glory. Uh, there's the sound of a tame tongue uh, saying thank you to one another uh, and offering words words of encouragement. Uh, there's the sound of scriptures uh, being read uh, and prayers being lifted uh, that can soothe the most damaged soul. Uh, there is a sound when God comes to your house. Ought to be able to hear God in your, in your voice and how you talk. I ought to be able to, to hear God. I, I, I don't hear God in that. I, I ought to be able to hear God in, when you're talking to somebody, you're talking to your neighbor, when you're Talking on the telephone, you ought to be able to hear God when you're talking to the person on your pew when you walk in the church. And, and I ought to be able to hear God, what you say, what you do. I ought to be able to hear the sound of the Holy Ghost. The citizens of, of, of Feldrick, uh, Austria, they didn't know what to do because Napoleon's massive army was preparing to attack this small town. Soldiers had been spotted on the heights above the town, which was situated on the Austrian border. So a group of citizens was hastily pulled together to decide whether they should try to defend themselves or display the white flag of surrender. It happened to be Easter Sunday, resurrection, resurrection day that day. And so the people gathered in the local church. The pastor got up that Sunday morning and said, friends, we have been counting on our own strength. And apparently our strength has failed. As this is the Lord's day of resurrection, let me just ring the bells, have our service as usual, and we're going to leave the rest to God. We know only our weaknesses, and what we don't know is the power of God to defend us. Oh, so the council accepted the plan, and it started ringing the church bells, ringing the church bells, ringing the church bells. The enemy, the enemy heard the sudden sound of the bells. Napoleon and his army heard the sound of the bells, and they concluded that the whole Austrian army had arrived during the nighttime to defend this little group of people who was hovered in this church. Before the service ended, Napoleon and his army broke camp and left the town, all because of the sound of the presence of God. 
Let me park parenthetically for a moment. The scriptures often talk about sounds. Sounds often precede or come before they announce the presence of God's powerful movement. You, you, you do know I'm in the Bible. God brought forth the children of Israel with the sound of freedom. John the Baptist was a voice, that sound crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. The sound brought forth Jesus, and here we are 50 days after Jesus got up, and here's another sound, the sound of prophecy, the sound of progress. The enemy can't stand the sound of God's people. That's why you can't remain silent, because there's power in your sound. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sound a rushing mighty wind. Sound make a joyful noise. Sound shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Sound shout to the Lord all the earth. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. When you saw he was healed, he turned back and praised God with a loud voice. Sound your sound is an indication that God is in the building. If you let him in, if you hide his word in your heart, then your life will produce some sounds that make the devil run scared. The sound of your reserved word, the sound of your songs of praise, the sound of your prayers being offered, the sound of your joyous jubilation. You got to get some new sounds. Uh, instead of giving up, you'll get a new sound that says, wait on the Lord uh, and be of good courage uh, and he shall strengthen your heart. Uh, instead of being wounded by worry, uh, you get a new sound. Uh, be anxious for nothing, uh, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, uh, let your request be made known unto God. Uh, God's sound brings new life. Uh, God's sound brings a new anointing. Uh, God's sound can give you strength. Uh, let God in and you'll hear some new sounds. There's a sound of his presence. There's a sign of his power. But the third, third thing that happens, and I'm done, is that there's a surge in your kingdom productivity. There's a surge in your kingdom productivity. The text says there came a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. That was a supernatural surge in the room because the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, came into the house. And the surge inside the house, the surge that filled their hearts, led to a surge outside of the house. These folk in the upper room needed a surge. They needed the Spirit of God in their houses to energize them, to galvanize them, to empower them, to comfort them. But this wasn't just about them. It was about improving their productivity for the kingdom of God. Just a few weeks earlier, remember, these were dejected, disheartened, and disillusioned people. They needed a surge in their lives because their Savior had died so that the gospel could advance into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. When God comes into your house, it didn't just so you can feel the power of God's presence for yourself, just so you can feel God's good comfort, so you can feel good about yourself, so you can get your shout on. But he shows up to upset the status quo. He shows up to help you be more productive as a witness for him. He shows up so you're inspired to advance his mission. He shows up so you can be a light in the world. There's a surge in your productivity. When the Spirit of God came to their house, the text says that they started speaking in languages they'd never heard or spoken. They needed God so they could minister to people they did not know and some people that had formerly been adversaries. Folk they never had hung out with because they didn't grow up on the same side of the scratch line. They had a surge in their productivity. When you let God in your house, when we do this collectively as God's church, as an Acts 2 church, it gives us the power to speak a language about our God, a language about God's love that connects with people from all walks of life. The Holy Spirit is the continuing, because you do know the Holy Ghost is the continuing community connecting reality that has moved throughout history to connect our yesterday with our tomorrow. That's the Holy Ghost that does that. That's why time, we time is filled with swift transition, but we don't lose time because the Holy Ghost connects yesterday with today. Because the Holy Ghost was here back then, and the Holy Ghost is here right now. Without the Holy Ghost, you've got no power to produce. Just so happened. At that day, Jerusalem was filled with people from all over the world who were there to celebrate Jewish Pentecost. When they heard the shouts of praise from the one church of one accord and in the one Holy Spirit, they understood what was said and they asked, how can this be? These men are all from Galilee and yet we hear them speaking Aramaic. We hear them speaking our language. They are speaking Russian and they're speaking English, speaking Latin. How, how can this be? We, we hear them in our own native language, and, and I hear what they're doing is they're proclaiming the power of Almighty God. 
And when they tried to make sense of it all, these, there were those in the crowd who tried to make a joke out of it. <coughs> and said, oh, they just drunk with new wine. Because the people who were talking like to get drunk with old wine. So they're drunk. They're drunk with new wine. They like to get drunk, but they were teasing them because it was new wine. You, you do know that even after you let God in, after we let God into the church, there will always be those who will not understand or appreciate or choose to not be a part of the movement of the Holy Spirit. There will always be those who will try to throw water on the fire, but if you're truly anointed with the fire that falls from God, God will give an answer and the boldness to proclaim it. I'm in the text. Watch what happens. Your productivity surges. Peter, Peter, yeah, that same Peter. You remember Peter, Peter, the same Peter, crazy, out of his mind, Peter. All of us got some Peter proclivities. Peter, cuss and cut you. Peter, yeah, Peter, the once defamatory, denying disciple who begged, told Jesus, I will never, ever kick you to the curb, Jesus. I, I'm going to ride with you to the end, Jesus. There, there's nobody that can make me act like I don't know you. And as soon as they walked up on him, he said, no, I don't know him. Then they asked him again. He said, didn't I tell you I don't know him? And then the third time they asked him and he cussed him out and said, boop, 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 beep, mother, boop, boop, boop. I don't know him. Same Peter. Same Peter. Same Peter. Same Peter. Same Peter. Peter stands up. He stands up in the text and he says, he says, we ain't drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. He didn't say I'm not going to get drunk. Right, stop. Partly just, he didn't say that. That's not in the text. He said, we, they are not drunk. Because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, too early for us to be drunk. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass that in these last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I like that part. All flesh. Because we like to categorize God. We think only certain people get access to the Lord. And only certain kinds of people who look a certain kind of way and do a certain kind of thing can get to the Lord. But he said, I will pour out my spirit on all, say all, say all, all flesh. Oh, that's good news to the poor. That's sight for the blind, captives, freed, welcome for the wanderer, grace for the guilty, mercy for the messed up. The church needs a surge in our productivity. Some folks have said nowadays that we're irrelevant. Some folk believe that they can just be a positive thinker. As long as I think positively, I don't allow negative thoughts into my mind, then I'm, I'm a good person. I can, I can live my life. So church, we need to produce all flesh. All flesh is supposed to see the glory of the Lord revealed, not just bishops and elders and, and, and priests and deacons and licentiates evangelists, but all flesh. Not just leading lay people and big names and big givers and church pillars and leading families, but all flesh. Not just adults, but children, the seasoned, the young, the old, the middle-aged, the single, the married, the loved in, the left out, all flesh. Not just the rich or the educated, the privileged, the mighty, but all flesh. It shall come to pass that whosoever... I love that word in the Bible. Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love whosoever. Because if we put the rules in place, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad God didn't leave it up to us to put the rules in place. Because we, we would have a list of rules that none of us can follow. That we ain't following them, but we expect you to follow them. But, but, but Jesus canceled all that out. He, whosoever. You know, that means Lottie, Dottie, and, and everybody. Who, whosoever, who, whosoever, that, 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 that's you, that's me, mama, them, everybody. That's whosoever, Pookie and Ray Ray and Mamma, all of whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And because God was in Peter's heart, because God was in Peter's house, the Spirit of God added 3,000 souls that day to the kingdom. In one day. The church increased by 3,000 because the Spirit brings life and produces good fruit. Years ago, the founder of Salvation Army, they were holding an international convention, and General William Booth, who was the founder, he couldn't go because he was physically weak. And so he sent his convention message to them. It was one word on the paper, and the word simply said, others. 
A primary reason we need God in the house is so that others might know that he is and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. We need spirit-filled believers who let God in. When God comes in, souls can reconnect with their Savior. When God comes in, the left out are loved in. When God comes in, others are able to find the mercy seat. The wounded can find healing. The sad can find joy. There's a surge in your kingdom productivity. And you know the only reason that God comes to your house is because of what Jesus did for us over 2,000 years ago. And I'm done. Can I park here for just a moment? There was, there was down in my part of the world in, when I, I were in Virginia, in Appomattox, Virginia, in Appomattox, there, there, there was a tobacco farm. My, my granddaddy, my granddaddy was a tobacco sharecropper in Maryland and, and in Virginia there was this tobacco farmer, his name, they used to call him Papa Charles, down, 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 down in Appomattox. When the tobacco was cut and dried, it had to be taken to the auction house down in the town so he could make his money. Most of the journey from Papa Charles' house to the town was flat, but there was one real steep hill that had to be negotiated. So when the tobacco was loaded into huge barrels and loaded into the wagon, Papa Charles, they tell me, would, would hitch Buck. Buck was his ox that he had. He would borrow from his cousin Buck the ox. He would hitch Buck to the back of the wagon. I can imagine that the team of horses pulling the wagon probably wondered why they were being slowed down on their journey by a slow-moving ox. You do know horses think they're more regal than oxen. Uh, oh, they probably looked back and said, what is that behind? We don't need no ox to help us pull this wagon. Uh, well, at the bottom of the hill, Papa Charles would stop the wagon and hitch buck the ox to the front of the horses. Oh, oh man, that must have messed with the horse's dignity and they didn't believe how dare you put an ox in front of these regal horses. What an insult to these proud horses. This must have been for old slow ox uh, to be put in front of them. Well, up the hill they would go. Uh, but about halfway up the hill, they tell me that the horse's strength uh, would begin to give out and the wagon and his cart would start to slip back down the hill. Uh, when Buck the old ox uh, start to feel the pull of the harness, uh, he would fall down on his knees uh, and hold the cart in place. Uh, when the horses had the chance to rest, uh, they would get up and begin to pull the wagon back up the hill. Uh, when the strength of the horses failed, uh, when the load was too heavy for them to bear, uh, when they couldn't get the job done on the hill, uh, Buck held the cart. Uh, when they started losing ground, uh, old Buck got down on his knees uh, and held that cart. Uh, when the hill was too much for him, uh, Buck held that cart. Uh, and I didn't come today uh, to teach a lesson on the strength of the ox, uh, but Buck reminded me uh, of somebody else uh, who held our cart. Uh, we had a sin-sick soul, uh, but Jesus held the cart. Uh, his cart was an old rugged cross uh, up Calvary's hill. Uh, he got down on his knees uh, and held the cart. Uh, he held it uh, with nails in his hands, uh, with nails in his feet. Uh, he held it uh, and he let out a sound of forgiveness, uh, but he held the cart. Uh, he gave the sound of grace, uh, but he held the cart. Uh, on Friday he died, uh, but he held the cart. Uh, and my Bible says uh, that early on Sunday morning, uh, there was a surge. Uh, the stone was rolled away. Uh, you do know that there's power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Jesus. So whenever you feel your strength getting weak, if you would just let Jesus be out in front of your life, if you, you just let him, just let Jesus, stop trying to put Jesus back in the background of your life. But, but if you ever let him out front, whenever you get tired, whenever you get weak, you start falling back down, you... Jesus said, I, I go down on my knees. And the Bible says he makes intercession. He at the right hand of the Father. So, so when you get weak, if you let him out front, you get weak and Jesus start praying. Father, uh, they need your help. Father, they, they don't know what it's like. Just help me help them bear the load. But you got to let Jesus... Get in front. Got to let God into your house. Got to let him in. And there's a sign of his power. There's the sound of his presence. And there's a surge in your productivity. Will you let God into your house? Stand with me all over God's house.
Father God, we thank you that there is no box with you. Give us the courage, the strength, the stamina, the, the wisdom to let Jesus guide our lives up the steep hills of life. God, we pray that we would be committed to letting you in, to letting your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us, to letting you direct our paths and order our steps.